Okay. Hey, Rosa. Hey, Ross. How are you? I'm pretty good. I hear I hear traffic. I'm 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 broadcasting live from the uh, spacious and elegant studio at the New America Foundation, which has taken me in. I'm homeless because my laptop committed suicide. Uh, where are you? I'm I'm broadcasting live from the Watergate, which is where the Atlantic's offices are. So I'm I'm just about eight blocks away from you, and theoretically we could be doing this face to face. But, but that would completely ruin the experience if we could actually see each other and didn't just have to stare geekily at cameras, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. Where are uh, you? Yeah, is. it's great. It's great. To, great to be here. I thought maybe we could start off um, because really there hasn't been enough said about the Virginia Tech massacre. Definitely not. So I thought, Definitely not. Thought we could start off talking about that. And you mm -hmm. wrote a column about this, I guess, about a week ago. Last Friday. Yes. And 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 you you wrote a column about um, and correct me if I misinterpret this at all, but sort of bemoaning the idea of vicarious trauma in American culture, the idea that not only the people who were in Norris Hall when the shootings were actually happening, but also the broader community of college students and kids more generally are all supposedly in need of grief counseling or, you know, reassurance or something because yeah. of this disaster. Yeah. And you thought that's ridiculous. I, I think it is ridiculous, uh, and I actually think it's worse than ridiculous. I started off just thinking it's ridiculous, you know, that, that to get a grip people, this is a terrible, terrible tragedy. You know, you can't even conceive of how devastated the friends and family members of the people who were killed must feel. But let's respect their grief enough to recognize that it's their grief. You know, it's not our grief. And let's stop being, you know, saying, oh, I'm so traumatized, we all have to take a day off from work and have candlelight vigils, you know, and seek trauma counseling. I, so I started off thinking it was just sort of ridiculous and self-indulgent. And, and after I began to think about it more and more, I, I actually started feeling more hostile to the sort of collective orgy of, uh, you know, national self-pity and maudlin uh, it, it, the, the Washington Post actually had a really interesting interview this morning. I don't know if you saw it. Um, I, I haven't, no. Uh, they, they, inter they, they had a piece on a couple of Virginia Tech students, two guys, seniors, who didn't know anybody who got killed and weren't there. <laughs> You know, they were on the other side of campus. One of them was interviewing for a job in Richmond and talking about how strange it is to have the entire nation fixated on them and their alleged pain when, in fact, they're very confused. You know, they feel like, God, this is terrible, but, you know, it didn't happen to me. You know, it happened right. to people I've never met, and I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. And I, I began to really see this whole festival of, of collective grief as both depoliticizing in the ways that it, you know, precisely people are killed every day. They die of cancer. They're killed by drunk drivers. They die. Nine soldiers died today in Iraq. You know, God knows how many Iraqi civilians died. You know, people die all over for all kinds of reasons. And it's both a little depoliticizing and decontextualized to take these deaths, tragic as they are, and say these are the deaths that matter. And it's coercive insofar as the many, many people, including these two kids profiled at Virginia Tech, it sort of it's saying to them, and if you don't feel grief-stricken nonstop, then there's something wrong with you, uh, you know, if you're not getting into the spirit of this. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, one, I thought it was interesting um, near the end of your column you talked about, I think you quoted someone who said that, maybe it was USA Today, yes. who said that specifically they aren't just worried about the kids at Virginia Tech, they're worried about this whole generation because no generation of kids has grown up in an era when violence took place and there was a 24-7 news cycle. So, sure, you know, there were wars and terrible things in 1968 and so on, but because there wasn't CNN and Fox right. News and so on broadcasting it around the clock, there wasn't the same level of vicarious trauma. Right. And, I, I mean, that, that actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 27, so I was a teenager when the first wave of high school shootings started. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think I was just a freshman in college when Littleton happened um, right. in Colorado, but there had been a series of school shootings before this. Right. And it, it, it was, I, I, I don't know, it was interesting reading that quote from USA Today because it was both ridiculous, um, but also there, there was some slight grain of truth mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. but I don't think that the grain of truth was that um, you know, kids are necessarily traumatized. I think that there's an, a, a strange urge 
almost among adults in a way to always impose right. traumas on kids. Right. And, 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 and I, I, what this made me think of actually wasn't uh, the school shootings in the 1990s, but um, because I, I actually don't remember that having any particular impact on me and my high school, except that I would think to myself, oh, you know, I can kind of, kind of understand how that happened because there right. are clearly, you know, there are a couple of people in every high school who, right. who, you know, you can just tell that they would fantasize about God, I, the place. you know, just to break in for one second, uh, it, I, in some ways it's always amazing to me that these things don't happen more often. Just, I mean, I was a pretty well-adjusted kid. I can remember feeling so angry as an adolescent. And, of course, you know, I didn't go out and kill anybody. And most angry adolescents don't. But so many much angrier people are out there. And in, in some ways, it's always kind of shocking to me that these aren't happening once a week. But well, my, my theory of why, you know, p people said, well, why is there this rash of school mm -hmm. shootings in the 90s? And my thought was similar to yours. I thought once it happened once, right, right. it was inevitable. Like once the idea could be planted in the mm -hmm. mind of the high schooler, it was sort of inevitable that it would right. keep happening. And because actually, it was like, oh, you can do this. There, well, then there was a guy. Uh, there was a an op-ed, I think, actually in the LA Times a couple of days ago by a guy who has studied school shootings, who says. You know, the media coverage on this is, is the, in, the intensity of the media coverage is the single biggest thing that is probably going to produce more of these because mm -hmm. what we, the one thing that we know that these, the sort of profile of the school shooter is that they are desperately seeking attention and gratification and they want to be famous and, and we're giving it to them. And, you know, the, the lesson that we're now sending is this is actually a really effective way to, you know, gain immortality. Yeah, well, and it's it's interesting too that now it's happened in a college because one mm -hmm. of the yeah, which is both more understandable and less understandable. I mean, the the, the thing about high school is that you know I think most of the high school sh school shooters you could sort of assume that they were going around killing people they knew, right? And that they were really they were acting out sort of the true darkest right. of the dark high school fantasy where you kill your teachers, yeah. you kill the girl who wouldn't go out with you, you kill the bully who picked on you, and so right. forth. For this to happen in college, I mean, it did. It does seem like it started out with the killer killing a girl he may have, have been fixated on, mm -hmm. but from then it just sort of moved to what I assume was completely random shooting. I mean, he picked a building, right. but right. within that building there was a true randomness to right. it. And I don't know whether that makes... Yeah. Right. It makes it more likely or less likely that you'd have a coffee cat, but it seems like an interesting, an interesting difference. Well, go go back. I was interested in what you were saying a second ago before oh. before I interrupted you um, about well, I, about the ways in which it sort of felt like adults are imposing this notion that children have been traumatized on on kids. Well, I what made me think about this was a story actually in the Post as well, and I, I think it was before Virginia Tech, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, it, it was a story about you know, whether the current generation is particularly traumatized by global warming. <laughs> and, it, and you know, the reporter... And, I seek therapy you know, on a worked, daily basis as a result yeah. of global warming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you've worked in, you know, if right. you've worked in journalism, you know how these stories happen. Right, like right, right. Some, some editor right. has the idea and goes to a reporter and says, hey, could you go to a school <laughs> and see if, see if any kids are really traumatized by global warming? And so the right. reporter goes to the school, and sure enough, there are some There's kids some who There's some kid who wakes up in a cold sweat every night saying... Right. And yeah. so they had some, what, what seemed like kind of ridiculous quotes mm -hmm. uh, from kids saying, oh, yeah, you know, I wrote, I wrote a short story for my daddy where it ended with the whole world being destroyed and so on. But it, but it made me remember, um, you know, I, I went to high school in the 90s, um, and global warming was you know, a pretty big thing then, too. Particularly, I grew up in southern Connecticut, went to a pretty liberal high school, and, you know, I, I think... The, global, the fear of global warming has seeped out into the broader culture, mm -hmm. but it was pretty strong among sort of upper middle class white people right. in New Haven, Connecticut right. in 1996. And the other thing that was really strong was the fear of overpopulation. Right. And I, I actually, I remember, you know, having these really nice, really well-meaning biology teachers, you know, throughout um, grade school and junior high and high school who would talk to us constantly about issues like, you know, they bring out the biology they say, don't textbook. have children, Ross. Whatever you do, well, don't well, have and they, kids. Right. They, they talk about carrying capacity, right. and, you know, which is a very scientific-sounding term. And it was like, well, the Earth is about to reach its carrying capacity, right. and, you know, then, uh, you know, then mass starvations will result and, right. and so on. And, 
and I don't think that I was particularly traumatized by it, but, but it was this sort of, right. you could tell that the adults were taking some weird kind of pleasure in taking their sort of vague right. fears and teaching them to their children. Well, it's, it's in some ways the 20th century, right, was the, the and, and indeed this new one as well, the, the, the century of apocalyptic fear, you know, that, that it was the, the era of, of nuclear, you know, the nuclear threat, uh, and, and population certainly reaching a level to raise the specter that, you know, earlier eras of human history, people could imagine and experienced, in fact, repeatedly catastrophic events from, from droughts and famines to catastrophic plagues and wars. But, but the idea that, you know, we could destroy the planet and the human species could be wiped out, uh, that, you know, I think that that's a uniquely... Not, feels like a relatively recent fear, and, and I think that the mm -hmm. earlier versions of that, right, in the 1980s, we, we all thought that the arms race was going to lead to, you know, the U.S. and the Soviets lobbying nukes at each other. That, that in turn, was a replay of the 1950s, duck and cover, you know, you know the whole right. generation of kids who grew up really, really fearing atomic warfare. Um, you know, so in some ways, maybe global warming is the post-Cold War version of our... Uh, our technology has the speed of technological development has so far outpaced the speed of our brain development. You know, are we going to destroy ourselves? And you know, it's a variant on the same theme. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, it's. I mean, I think it's a less. You know, the thing with the nuclear arms race was literally someone could right. push a button and destroy the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Right. So at least there was. You know, the fear. The fear of global warming is totally legitimate, but it's also not something where, you know, six-year-olds in, in Topeka, Kansas should actually be worrying about, you know, their lives being destroyed in the next five years. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you in, my, the, in the my droughts, darker moments, I'm not, I'm not sort of, I'm not particularly an environmentalist. I've, I've partly because I'm a, a human rights person, I've always had a little bit of a, you know, I'm going to worry about the trees when I'm taking care of the people. Um, right. But that said, despite having some, some innate skepticism about people who are more worried about the environment than about the humans. Uh, even I have gotten to the point where, you know, I, I don't know if you, have, do you ever read, there's a great J.G. Ballard novel, The Drowned World. Um, oh, no, I haven't read he's it. He's a great yeah, writer. He read uh, Empire of the Sun. Or mm -hmm. Maybe you saw the movie. Um, he's a great writer, and, he's, and you know, it's, it's a pre-global warming fantasy, but it's a fantasy about the ice caps melt and, and, you know, the skyscrapers in New York and London are surrounded by water, and the last survivors are, you know, eking out their desperate existence amidst the, amidst the water. Uh, and this had a tremendous impact on me when I was 13 or 14 when I read it. And, and I, you know, I worry. I, I do worry about it. I, I don't, I, I have to admit, I don't worry about it enough to do whatever Cheryl Crow is suggesting, you know, carry a little, you know, reusable napkin snap to my elbow um, or whatever she was suggesting we do. I no doubt I should, et cetera. But, but. But although, although it hasn't yet gotten to the point where I'm changing my life in any way whatsoever, I'm beginning to wonder whether, indeed, perhaps I, I should. Don't you feel that way well, a little bit? Well, I mean, I, I sort of... Are you buying everybody gets, on Everybody gets shaped by, by how, how they grow up. And part of, I, I think that I probably err too far in the opposite direction. Um, I mean, I, you know, think that global warming is pretty clearly happening. I think that, you know, it's a serious problem that needs to be addressed and so on. But... I, I don't think I've ever had had a moment, except maybe while watching an inconvenient truth, which sort of which forces you forces you to worry, even right. even when you know Al Gore is slightly exaggerating something. Um, but right. but apart from that, I don't think there's ever been a moment where I've actually felt a real thread of worry about it. But and part of that I, I think is actually the result of, you know, I was a child during the 80s and right. 90s. The 80s as you said, were a decade where everyone was sure that the nuclear arms race was going to wipe us out, and then... So this seems like no big deal in, in well, comparison growing, to Well, and then growing up in the 90s, you know, the population right. bomb idea, which right. totally fizzled out, and now everyone's worrying about underpopulation in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, my default assumption is that, you know, the catastrophe isn't going to happen. And, may, and that's perhaps a foolish assumption because, you yeah. know, someday the catastrophe is going to happen. Sometimes catastrophes do happen, right. I mean, yeah. I mean they do happen. Um, and you don't have kids, do you? No. 
No. I mean, one thing that I think did sort of change my view about all these things, about risk and my, my time horizon for thinking about risk was definitely having children. You know, that, that, that all of the truisms, I mean, it's a, it's a complete cliche, right, that, you know, you want to leave a better world to your children. Well, we don't have children. That's pretty abstract. You know, you think, well, you know, sort of things will take care of themselves. And, and that definitely did change for me when I had kids, you know, that suddenly there are these real little people who you love unbearably and, and you try to think about the world that they are growing up to inhabit. And I think that that, that, that did change my, uh, on things like global warming, whereas before I had kids, I was like, oh, you know, so, so the world will be hot, too bad for the future generations. They'll just have to find some way to deal with this. And they will, you know, and lots of people suffer, but they'll deal. You know, now I, now I feel a little bit more, I, I mean, I, it shouldn't make the difference, right? I, I ought to have Well, no, I mean, I think, I think it should. Human. I think it, you, you know, know, that's... <laughs> I mean that the, the, the human race wouldn't right. do very well if we didn't spend a lot of time right. thinking about our children. Right. But I, let's go back to uh, Virginia Tech, uh, not Virginia Tech itself, but the whole issue. The, the USA Today uh, quote that I, I cited in, in the column you mentioned, um, uh, which basically said, "Oh, the, the, the you know yes, other generations, other generations of young people saw their share of horrors. You know they lived through two world wars, Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. But you know no generation has ever had this kind of string of quote as they put it mass catastrophes. And then they then you know ran off a list from the uh, space shuttle explosions uh, to to Oklahoma City to Columbine, 9/11, uh, and the Virginia Tech shootings, and. And I admit my reaction was, uh, uh, you know that it is, the, you know, it is not the same to fight in World War II and to watch, watch 9/11 on TV. Watch the Challenger explode you know? on TV. Yeah, these just are not the same things. And I, I here, here, I'm actually going to sound like a conservative uh, here, but I find myself having a great deal of sympathy with the sort of conservative line of thinking. He says, God, Americans have gone soft. You know, what's wrong with us? You know, they get a grip, people. But yes, these are sad. These are sad. They're hard to watch. You know, how could you not, how could you, you know, if you watch, you were watching the Challenger, the Space Shuttle, you know, I, I remember watching that as a kid and just, just, oh, terrible, 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 you know, and, and just thinking about it for, you know, weeks afterwards and having it be a painful thought, and of course. But it's not the same as, you know, being in a concentration camp during World War II. It is just not the same, guys. And, and I worry that that tendency is not just about young people. I mean, I think this USA Today article is sort of focusing on, you know, the millennial generation, what's the effect on them going to be. But that is projection, I think, because I think, you know, the young people, the kids are okay, you know. But, but what, I, what worries me, and, and, uh, and here's, where my, here's where I'll snap back to my liberal self, okay, you know, the, it, it was like our reaction. I was getting to, worried there for, for a minute. But yeah. <laughs> it was like our reaction to 9-11. You know, 9-11 was a horrific, horrific, horrific tragedy. But 3,000 people were killed. You know, that's, that's a lot of people. That is 3,000 too many. It's, it's, it's horrendous. You know, we have every reason to feel appalled and, and devastated and to think that we need to respond in some way to that. But... But we have treated it, you know, it's led to all kinds of, you know, a kind of a wholesale rethinking of everything from taboos on torture to how we conduct our foreign policy, in, which, which some of those ways of rethinking, not the torture part, but some of the ways are probably overdue, you know, focusing on the threat posed by non-state actors, et cetera, way overdue. But, but in some ways, I feel a little bit like what a bunch of wimps we are, you know, how many people died during World War II that didn't make us go, oh, my God, we need to completely reconsider our commitment to our basic bedrock constitutional values, you know, and then 3,000 people get killed and we're all going, oh, the sky is falling, you know, America is under threat, the, na the life of the nation is at risk, you know, nothing can be held sacred any longer, you know, we just have to do whatever it takes, which in a way seems to me related to this tendency to say, you know, that 9-11, that, that Columbine, the space shuttle explosion and Hurricane Katrina are all the same kind of thing uh, and compare in some direct way to, you know, the Holocaust and the Vietnam War and World War I and World War II, which killed millions and millions and millions of people. I mean, I, yeah, I always wonder, clear, clearly the media had, plays, does play a huge role in this. What I can't tell is, is it that the country has actually gone soft? 
or is it? We're or is a bunch it of wimps. Or, or is it that the country is basically the same, but there's this right. overlay of sort of, you know, a media industry that thrives on hysteria? Right. And and it's hard. It's hard for me to say. I mean, I, I think you know, talking about the aftermath of 9/11, um, you know, you you would read over and over again, both on the left and on the right. I think. I think conservatives exploited it in terms of saying, well. Right. You know, we need we need to do whatever it takes now. You know, the world has changed. 9/11 showed us that nothing will be, ever be the same. And then people on the left immediately started saying, "Well, you know, George W. Bush has America in this constant state of fear, right. and you know, everybody's jumping at terrorists under their beds, and that's the only reason they're voting for Bush, and so on." And I think both of these were, you know, I, I don't think Americans were in anything like a constant state of terror after about, you know, three weeks after 9-11 when it became clear that, okay, you know, there weren't going to be right. media follow-up attacks yeah. immediately and, and, right. and so on. Um, so, I mean, I like, I like to think that it is just sort of, you know, politicians and pundits and so on responding to the, to the demands of the 24-hour news cycle and that, you know, the American people are actually not traumatized. They mm -hmm. actually would rise to the occasion if faced with a real replay of World War II and so on. But yeah. yeah, it's 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 sort of hard to say for sure. Well, because the, because the, there's a feedback cycle, there's a feedback loop between the two. I mean, I I actually basically think that you know Americans have the capacity to be pretty tough uh, and to be pretty resilient and to make a lot of sacrifices and to be pretty courageous. Um, I also think that you know we often succumb, you know, that we've got our good angels and our bad angels, you know, and the bad angels, the sort of little, you know, Oprah angel whispering in our ear, oh, my God, your life is so hard, you know, just pour it all out and be traumatized, and, and the good right. angel saying kind of, you know, get a little bit of backbone here and, to make some, you know, pull your socks up and, you know, stiff upper lip and chin up and, you know, let's deal, let's think, you know, let's think very pragmatically about, you know, how serious of a threat is it, you know, how does it compare to other kinds of threats? What can we do about it? You know, how do we actually assess risks in some kind of a rational way and recognize that, that not all risks are the same? You know, that, that to say that there is a risk of another terrorist attack, absolutely there is a risk of another terrorist attack, but, you know, the risks of different kinds of terrorist attacks are very different. You know, that, right. that, 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 you know, there's one level of risk that somebody's going to lob a nuclear weapon at us, a terrorist, which is actually very, very low, you know, although it would be very bad if it happened, but it's a very, very, very low. You know, there's a much, much greater risk that somebody could sneak something bad in, you know, via, via a container ship. Um, you know, there are other levels of risk all over the map on different kinds of acts, and yet our response, you know, we, we end up having our response be driven by sort of the most irrational media-driven fears um, rather than by any kind of rational you know, let's really think very seriously about the, the costs and benefits of different policy approaches. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, talking about parenthood, it's like the phenomenon of child predator right. obsession uh, among yeah. upper middle class parents, where, right. you know, the number, the risk of your child actually being kidnapped by a child predator on the way to school is roughly the same as your child's risk of getting struck by lightning. Right. It's actually about twice your child's risk of getting struck, by, struck and killed by lightning. Struck but, and killed. But it's still, okay. it's extremely low. You're absolutely, it's extremely, extremely low. Uh, and, of course, nobody thinks about, you know, what are the various risks of, of, you know, bringing up a child who never does anything by themselves and then goes out and has, you know, never developed any judgment or capacity for autonomous life because you've overprotected them and then does something catastrophically stupid, uh, right. you know, in adult life and gets killed because... You know, they never had the experience of of learning how to be autonomous earlier on. Uh, well, let's let's talk for a minute about a, a what's sort of a related but slightly different response to Virginia Tech, which is the response right. um, of Barack Obama right. in in a speech he gave shortly after the massacre. Right. Um, and I know you're on record as a big fan of Barack Obama. He's the Messiah. And, uh, generally, it's not, like, you know, like, it's not about fanhood. It's about the fact that he's the Messiah. Right. Okay. Right. Well, no. Fair. Fair <laughs> enough. I mean, I, I actually can't argue with that. No. I. I. I this. This is going to sound really strange. This is probably too confessional for Blogging right. Heads TV. But I actually had a dream last night in which I saved Barack Obama from an assassination attempt. And what did he say to you? He After didn't. Well, the, the, the dream ended. Actually, I shouldn't say saved because the dream ended with the outcome of the assassination attempt still somewhat in okay. doubt. 
but I was definitely we were playing trying a positive to role in 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 preventing this this assassination. And meanwhile, the Clinton campaign was shooting at you. Well, yeah. Now, I, I could, no, the assassins, I think, were, were rednecks of some type, okay. which, which, you know, is, is uh, just goes to show you. Um, even even conservatives think that rednecks Deep might assassinate down. black presidential candidates. Right. But, but anyway, so Barack Obama, possibly the messiah, um, certainly a very savvy politician, certainly, you know, the latest polls mm-hmm. have been pulling into a tie with Hillary Clinton really? nationally. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, the latest, the latest, I mean, it's, it's Rasmussen polls, which have tended uh-huh. to show um, better scores for Obama than, right. than, uh, than other polls, so it's a little bit unclear. But certainly it's clear his support has, has been sort of steadily rising over the last four months. Right. Um, but he gave this speech, and a lot of people uh, thought, and I think rightly, that it was kind of a bad speech. Um, and what, what he did, he sort of, he, he started with Virginia Tech and mm-hmm. sort of, you know, the violence there. And then he went on this long riff about, you know, how there are lots of other kinds of violence in American society, too. And he started with Imus and the girls from Rutgers, and then he segued into the, the violence of outsourcing and people losing their jobs mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. And, and so forth. And I thought this was, this was a remarkably bad speech at a, you know, pretty big moment for a presidential right. candidate, sort of, you know. A moment when you have a chance to show what you would do in in the bully pulpit, mm-hmm. um, but and and it was sort of somebody compared it to you know sort of warmed over Jesse Jackson, which is obviously the last comparison <laughs> Barack Obama wants right. being made um, at, at this point in the campaign. But I don't know. I was I was curious what you think of that sort of thread, like the idea of taking the taking the tragedy mm-hmm. and sort of using it as a springboard to talk about larger problems in American society. You know, it, it quoted quoted Bobby Kennedy, and it was yeah. really attempting to be very Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. I have really mixed feelings, because on the one hand, I agree with you that he kind of botched the speech in a way. You know, he took a kind of stock campaign speech in which he talks about things like unemployment, and, and he right. talks about uh, racism, and he talks about, you know, the, the host of other issues that we ought to be talking about. Of course, we ought to be talking about and and he wanted to say something, you know, he appropriately wanted to say something about Virginia Tech, um, but I think he, he wove it in not very persuasively and in a way that, that risked, risked being misconstrued and indeed has been misconstrued because I think he, he should have been more careful with his wording. It, it looked like a kind of a, you know, last-minute effort to sort of how, how can this be, you know, how can this be kind of, you know, jammed, uh, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm, I'm a phasic, I can't figure out my monkey wrench, monkey, whatever. You know what I mean? He tried <laughs> I know to, what you mean, yeah, jerry, jerry rig right. or something, something like that. Right, trying to kind of connect this thing that didn't really fit into this particular speech, but try to find a way to connect it. And and on the one hand, uh, you know, I, I, I think, as I, as I was saying before, I think that one of the dangers of the whole, oh my God, the Virginia Tech is sort of worse than anything that has ever happened before in the history of the world, uh, is very dangerous, among other things, because it, it, it operates to shut down, it decontextualizes and it depoliticizes, and it operates to shut down the empathy instinct for other forms of violence, for other deaths, as well as for the continuum of bad things that happen in the world that we need to think about, because they're, they're not unrelated to the sudden outburst of catastrophic violence. You know, so on the one hand, I think, you know, of course, you know, the Virginia Tech shooting should be an occasion for everybody to reflect on a very wide range of things, you know, from, gee, you know, what does this have to do with gun regulations, and are there, you know, is this something that could have been prevented with different or differently implemented regulations, or is that not the issue, you know, what does this have to do with violent video games, what does this have to do with, you know, bullying, what does this have to do with very, you know, there are a ton of things that probably have some connection to this. You know, and exactly how tight that linkage is in any given situation, you know, case, uh, you know, is, is, is up for debate. But, but of course, the tragedy should inspire all of us to talk about those things. And anybody who says, oh, this is a moment for grief at this terrible tragedy, let's not talk about gun control, let's not talk about bullying, let's not talk about violent video games, just shut up. I think, you know, I think that's really inappropriate. And indeed, you know, it's also an occasion to, to, you know, to, to say let's take that instinct of empathy for the people who have lost someone at Virginia Tech and think about the various other forms of pain and loss, you know, that, that, that 
are part of our world and have empathy towards those as well. Where I think Barack Obama made a mistake, and I think in, in, in many ways it was a rhetorical mistake rather than a, a substantive mistake. I mean, in substance, I agreed with everything in his speech, but I think he made a rhetorical mistake of talking about them all as forms of violence. Mm -hmm. um, just because I think that, that you know, in, 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 in one sense of the word violence, if we think of violence in the sort of literal, you know, one dictionary definition of violence is, is to, you know, to do damage to, to, to break, to, you know, to break apart. Um, something, and in that sense, you know, joblessness or a, a very painful racist insult is a form or forms of violence in that they, they injure and damage self-image, they injure and damage your ability, if it's a job, to feed yourself and your family. But, but the other more colloquial sense of violence, obviously, we reserve for uses of physical force. Um, and, and so I think that going in one breath from talking about uh, a form of palpable, physical, lethal violence that left 33 people dead, counting the shooter, to talking about Don Imus and unemployment is, is jarring. You know, and I think he could have avoided it very easily if he had simply said, let's use this you know, as an occasion to reflect on the fact that, you know, in many ways we have a society that leaves lots of people feeling injured. And let's mm -hmm. talk about those forms of injury. Some of them may be ones that we can't do anything about, but here are, here are some kinds of pain and hurt that if we took better care of, our, of each other, you know, if we had different policies that we might be able to reduce, now let me talk about racism, now let me talk about you know, health care and unemployment, I think he would have avoided the issue. I think it was the use of the same term violence for everything that, that did was a little tone deaf. Even yeah, well, I, mean, I, I think it was actually... The, the Imus thing in particular was, I think, the moment the moment where the speech jumped the shark. Um, just because I, I actually think one of the one of the things about the Virginia Tech shooting was it it sort of cast into relief just how mm -hmm. sort of small the whole Imus <laughs> debate mm -hmm. really was. It right. was sort of like right. you know in the same way that right. like all the summer Virginia. of the shark things yeah. look ridiculous after 9/11. It's the Imus is to Virginia Tech as Virginia Tech is to World War II. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but but no, I mean I, I, I agree. I think there's a. I, I think the the language of violence too in that context, mm -hmm. th there's sort of an association with, almost sort of, um, post uh, post communist Marxism in a way, sort of theories of you know third world subjugation and so on, where people talk about. Um, you know, sort of economic dislocation and economic mm -hmm. exploitation in terms of violence, and I think that that's a totally philosophical, philosophically defensible thing to right. do. Right. I think it's a bad idea for someone running for president right. in the United States of America, just because right. I, I don't think that's that's not a language that well, I think it's either a language appeals to American voters or you know the idea of unemployment as violence. Yeah. You know, in a university <clears throat> setting, you know, you can make you can make that argument, but. Right. You know, for, for the purposes right. of the people, Barack Obama wants to vote for right. him. It's, it's a language thing in, in that I think it was just a problem with the, the use of the word violence. You know, you talk about it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a form of hurt, as a form of pain, uh, as, as a form of damage that society does and tolerates to the most vulnerable members, yes. But, but although I agree, I mean, I think the term violence is, you know, philosophically defensible. It's... it's you know, it's not the colloquial usage, and, and a politician does need to be very much attuned not to, to, you know, the connotations of words. And 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 at a moment when, you know, at a moment when there's a lot of preoccupation with literal, actual violent death, that it's not the right moment to say, you know, uh, Don Imus's jerky, stupid, racist, idiot comments are the same thing. Um, as opposed to, as opposed to saying, you know, a culture that tolerates a high level of incivility, of unkindness, of hurtfulness, are, are, you know, is a culture that potentially creates angry people, you know, who go out and do terrible things. So let's also focus on how we can, you know, are there ways in which, um, are there ways in which we can create a more nurturing culture? And you know, I mean, I think that that's that's debatable, right? It's debatable whether that's the right thing to do, whether that's a job for government or whether this is just an exhortation to, you know, folks think about this, you know, next time you pass a, you know, next time you have an opportunity to be a jerk or to be nice, think about being nice because these things come back to bite us someday. Um, you know, I don't know, but 
Yeah, I was a little disappointed. Well, I think I think he'll be fine. I, I yeah. don't think anyone actually but I, paid attention I, 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 to the speech. You, you know why I was disappointed? I was disappointed because, as I said, I completely agreed with the speech, and I and I worry that 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 the sort of sloppiness and and not thinking about that word detracts from a message that is actually right and important. So. Well, I I also think though it's also it's a speech that might have gone over better mm -hmm. in three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems right. it seems like the you know or or even you know in our fast-paced media culture, two weeks or something. Right. But it, but it seems like there are sort of levels of appropriateness, and the appropriate initial political response right. is just bemoaning the tragedy. Then maybe you move on to sort of concrete questions right. like gun control, or it, it's interesting actually how Mental both health the services. right and left have, folk, have, have come around to their, their preferred narratives. The, you know, the left narrative is gun control. The conservative narrative is this is a problem with deinstitutionalization, and, you know, we need, we need to be, um, you know, when people are crazy, they need to be locked up and so right. on. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it, took about, it took about 24 hours to the left for the left to reach their narrative. I think it took about a week for the right, right. to figure out their narrative. But, right. but yeah, but in, in any case, and then, you know, eventually you can move on to sort of the higher ground of yeah. what, what this says about our culture. But, yeah. Um, but, well, any, moving on to an, an, another form of violence, maybe, and also, in a sense, Barack Obama, since um, all the Democratic candidates came out and issued statements um, immediately criticizing the Supreme Court mm -hmm. for its mm -hmm. uh, partial birth abortion ruling. Um, and I guess, I guess I'm just curious. I, I assume you're pro-choice? I am pro-choice. Well, why, why don't you? So, what's what's the smart pro-choice take on this ruling? Because oh, you've had a lot you know, of a lot of people. <laughs> you don't want to make me representative of anything, because then I'll I'll be denounced by the people. No, it's it's too you. late. You're 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 on the spot. You're um, on blogging heads. Basically, it seems like there are two there are two main right. running pro-choice narratives. Right. One of which is you can't chip away at Roe versus Wade at all. Um, you know, we, you have to defend every line, and this crossed a big line, even though the number of abortions it affects <coughs> is very small. Therefore, this is really right. bad news. The other line is that, you know, no, you shouldn't. It's you. You shouldn't be defending sort of you, right. that. That the pro-choice movement is sort of overexposed. It's, right. it's it's defending too many lines, and it's better to fall back yeah. and and so on and restore. Sort of public trust in the abortion laws that yeah. we have. Anyway, I, so what I, I am more in the second camp than in the first camp. But I, I mean, I, you know, I think. Do I worry about some of the language in Kennedy's opinion? Yes, I do. You know, pretty paternalistic, pretty, pretty making a lot of assumptions, uh, not warranted by the facts. But that said, um, I don't quite see why it's in the interest of anybody to act like it's a really sacred right to have, you know, late-term dilation and extraction technique. I mean, we, you know, it seems to me that the line on that ought, ought to be, yeah, this is pretty gruesome, and nobody wants this, and we need to come up with policies that create a situation which nobody ever needs to have this. You know, and saying there are occasionally circumstances in which, for one reason or another, you know, it's the only option and when a woman's health is at stake, uh, it shouldn't just be, is she going to die? It could also be, you know, is there a very grave risk to her life that nevertheless, we ought to have the flexibility for her doctors and her to make that call without the legislature making that call. You know, but that said, I, I, I think that the sort of, I, I do think that for, for, for too long, in a way, the pro-choice movement was so anxious that if you sort of gave an inch to the anti-abortion groups, they take a mile, that, that they backed themselves into a corner they shouldn't have had to be in, you know. That, that, that I, I actually do agree that everybody should be taking the line of, you know, let's work towards a situation where we don't have to have as many abortions. But, you know, in my case, I say let's have better education about contraceptive alternatives. You know, let's make sure we work on developing technologies that make morning after pills and other things safer and more effective. Uh, you know, let's, of course, I mean, this is the piece that the, that the right tends not to focus on. You know, let's make sure that women who choose to have a child and keep the child have the economic wherewithal to not have that be catastrophic for them and for their families. You know, that if a child is born, that we're going to take care of that child and not have that child end up, you know, suffering throughout their life because they were born poor and nobody wanted them. 
you know, and nobody's there to support them. Um, you know, but 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 it does seem to me that that you know, why do we want to get into a position where where we're defending something that very very few people need as as really close to our hearts? I mean, I even have always felt that the the pro-choice terminology is extremely unfortunate. Um, you know, that that it's it's it shouldn't and this I you know I think the Ruth Bader Ginsburg line of reasoning is indeed far, far more persuasive to me, you know, that it's about, it should be about equality, not about choices and, and on, it's, it, that, that formulating the right to abortion as being about the right to control your body and sexual and reproductive autonomy rights, uh, I think was the wrong place to locate it from a jurisprudential perspective, um, and that that, that that then forces you into various arguments that you shouldn't, you know, you don't want to go there. Why would you want to be defending? Why would you want to be going there? You know, you want to be defending this only as a last resort. Uh, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I actually, I, I feel ambivalent about saying this because, you know, I, I was marching for abortion rights as a college kid. And, you know, here too, I think in some ways having my own children did slightly change my view, you know, it, inevitably. I don't agree with Justice Kennedy that every woman who has an abortion you know, lives a, a lifetime of deep and abiding regret and psychological confusion. Um, but, but, you know, certainly it was pretty pow powerful for me at, at 12 weeks or so to have, an, you know, you do the ultrasound and you see this little fetus that looks like a baby, you know, and that looked like my baby, you know, and I can look at those ultrasound pictures now and I think that looks like, you know, that looks like my daughter, in, you know, that, that recognizable and you know, it certainly changed my notion of, oh, yeah, you know, I, I don't think that in, in, in month one, you know, I just don't buy that it is a full-fledged human life yet. But, you know, somewhere along that line, things start getting pretty dicey. And I don't at all think that supporters of abortion rights ought to be the ones arguing for pushing that line later and later. You know, that's just strategically and tactically just seems really mistaken. You know, that there is a very important right that's worth fighting to protect, but that's not the way to do it. Well, you've, you've probably made yourself hundreds of thousands of enemies in the last Eek. three minutes, so. <laughs> what do you think, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like no, to I mean, take uh, the liberal pro-choice position. Well, I, no, I, I mean, I, I think my, my suspicion well, we can both agree, actually, that I, I thought the um, – I, I agreed with the majority on, on the case. I thought the Kennedy opinion, like almost every Kennedy opinion I've ever read, was completely unpersuasive. And basically my impression of Kennedy's abortion jurisprudence is, you know, he, he just sort of, you know, shifts this way and that depending, right. <laughs> depending on, on, on sentiment, which – is obviously how most people approach, right. you know, the question of the morality right. of abortion. It's not really the approach you want the judge to be taking. Right. And, you know, sort of, it seems like he, you know, he was the unexpected deciding pro-choice vo vote in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Mm -hmm. And you can tell he feels sort of a little bit icky about what that's meant jurisprudentially. So he's sort of, he's tried to back away from this, in so, but, but in sort of strange directions. I, I agree that sort of all the talk about women being traumatized by abortion, while, you know, that's an important debate for people to have, isn't really that germane to the question of constitutional rights, ultimately. Like, you could clearly have a constitutional right to something that's emotionally traumatic, potentially. Right. Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, it strikes me in some ways that both sides, that <coughs> both, both the uh, pro-choice and anti-abortion sides, fall prey to sort of equal and opposite uh, reductio ad absurdum arguments. You know, the, the, the anti-abortion side ends up making a diff unpersuasive argument unless you, unless you just have a strong theological belief that, you know, the instant after conception you've got a full-fledged human being. Um, and for any, you know, unless you also believe in, in, in miracles in daily life, that's pretty unpersuasive. You've got a cell that's just split into, you know, it's split in two, basically. You know, you well, don't... Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that that argument has to be... I, I can see that people find mm -hmm. it unpersuasive. I don't, I don't think it's theological so much as, you know, it's... I mean, 
it's it's an ontological, philosophical, yeah. whatever you want to call but it. But it's argument. arbitrary. It's arbitrary, and it's at the harder. It's it's not well, a but it's particularly. An, it's an attempt to be to be less arbitrary than. You yeah, know, could, I don't think you're, you're going to have an arbitrary definition yeah. no matter what. I, I, mean, I, I don't. I, I don't think it's unprincipled. I think it's principled. But I think it's a, it's a hard sell. It's hard to convince the average person that you know a clump of cells that is just divided and just looks like a microscopic clump is a human being. It's not a hard sell to convince people you know that a 14 week or 16 week fetus that looks like a tiny baby is a human being. That's not a hard sell. You know, so so in some ways the the anti-abortion side has given themselves a rather hard task by trying to locate you know that full-fledged human life begins at, begins at conception. But equally, you know, the, the pro-choice, uh, you know, and I'm one, pro-choice people, I think, have also given themselves an unnecessarily hard road by trying to sort of make the argument that they're not quite willing to say exactly, you know, that exactly at what point it does become a full-fledged person. You know, clearly we all think it's something, you know, we all think infanticide is wrong, you know, so clearly walking back from that, you know, there's some moment when, you know, it shifts. But, but I think that the pro-choice, we've put ourselves in the uncomfortable position historically of trying to push that outward and outward, you know, and as abortion technologies have enabled that to happen, that pushing further and further out saying, well, clearly it's not a full-fledged human being at, you know, one day, clearly not at two days, clearly not at five days, clearly not at 12 days, <coughs> Clearly not at 25 days, clear, you know, and then once at some point, though, you start finding yourself in a place where, why do you want to be there? You know, why would you want to be there? Um, you know, and I mean, Roe Ro was kind of a goofy case, right? But, but I'm beginning to have some nostalgia for the old trimester framework, which had something going for it. Well, it had, no, what, what it had going for it, and the reason they latched onto it was it seemed to provide the kind of clear mm -hmm. definitions that it turns out pregnancy <laughs> actually lacks. You right. know, in, in, right. in the same way... You know, the Catholic position in the Middle Ages, roughly speaking, was, you know, because scientific knowledge was so scant, right. um, it was that quickening was the moment when abortion became right. became became immoral because it was assumed, right. well, there was something in a woman up till quickening, but it wasn't alive, and then it suddenly became alive. But now, uh, you know, now we know that's not true, yeah. which is why, you know, the Catholic Church has taken, you know, what what you what you would call the sort of more extreme, you know, mm -hmm. sperm sperm and egg uniting position. You know, I, mean, I, I, I think I think that you know, obviously, being generally pro life, my own <laughs> biases are automatically anti Roe. But I think that, you know, the the case, the case for having these kind of things determined by the legislature is precisely that you can then, you know, attempt to to hash out the kind of you know, sort of hodgepodge of exceptions and rules and so forth that I think accord more with people's moral sentiments about abortion. I mean, if you take if you take the case of partial birth abortion, and you know, after this ruling was handed down, Ed, Ezra Klein, a liberal blogger, posted this long story from the Washington Post from a woman who had to have a late term abortion, and her her fetus had, I think, spina bifida and so on. And you know, it, it was this obviously a heart-wrenching story about somebody who discovered very late in pregnancy that you know, right. their, their child was going, wasn't probably going to live outside the womb and, and, and so on. And, you know, you, you, right. take, you take a story like that, and my, my question for pro-choicers is always, well, you know, why, why does the argument that, you know, we, we have to have an exception where the woman, you know, who has a child who has spina bifida, you know, that woman has to have an abortion, why does that have to mean that we have 1.4 million abortions a year? And that, I think, is the place where, I mean, that's the situation that Roe has created. Now, it's true, obviously, pro-choicers are afraid of pro-lifers because, you know, they, they think, and rightly, uh, that... But know, I don't think that's... But, but, Ross, just, I mean, I don't have the figures at my fingertips, but, but I, I think that's wrong. Uh, abortion, the number of abortions did not appreciably increase relative to the population after Roe. The only thing that changed is the number of legal abortions went up, and the number of illegal I, abortions went down. Well, that... And, you know, actually, so I, I mean, I... That, that no, I, the, the, well, the number... there. Nobody knows exactly how many abortions right. there were prior to Roe versus Wade. The year after Roe versus Wade, there were 800,000 abortions. The year after that, there were something like 
and, and I don't have the statistics ready to hand either, but it was something like 1.3 to 1.4 yeah, million. Yeah, but, but I think all, of, all of the best research on that suggests that that is not because there are more abortions. It's just that the women who were having dangerous, illegal backstreet abortions were then able to have them legally. I, I mean, uh, you know, again, well, I, I, I mean, I guess we're, I think we're not, we're not, we, we, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to settle it. I mean, my we'll, my we'll understanding to, is actually that research is all. We'll have to send our viewers off to do further research on this. To do, off to do further research. But yeah, needless to say, you know, Coming, coming from the left on this, I, I say, stop fixating on abortion. You want to reduce the number of abortions. Let's stop having these inane policies that we're, you know, not allowed to tell kids about condoms. For God's sake, you know, you, you know, nobody should want to have lots of abortions because, by definition, with that many abortions, you know, the system is broken at a much earlier point. And, you know, so anyway, but that's well, right, and that's another case. Yeah, you know, again, right. we have to send send our, our viewers off right. to do further <laughs> research because my my understanding is that the the evidence that um, sex ed interventions seriously reduce the number of unplanned pregnancies is actually they they do in environments like South Central Los Angeles where you know the school is you know essentially the only institution in people's mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. and who can act totally in loco parentis but <clears> in most in most places the effect of sex ed regulations is so but I, look, look I, I i agree with you if it's the case that um you know it makes it makes no difference mm -hmm. that there will be 1.4 million abortions with or without um abortion laws then i think that that would you know that that would have to make pro-lifers reassess some of their premises i don't, I don't think you, that's true you know just to just to shift this to um a whole different and sort of interesting issue um, as you know, you know, one school of thought holds that, you know, with luck, the abortion debate is going to be obsolete at some future point because technology is going to change to, you know, improve contraception, to increase the immediate post-intercourse options for preventing conception at that point or immediately afterwards through variants of, you know, morning after pills and potentially through the introduction of technologies that essentially enable, you know, the, the fertilized egg or the, the very young fetus to be safely removed from right. the woman's body without cost to her health and, you know, nurtured in a, in a pleasant little, you know, pink painted test tube until it is able to prosper, you know, on its own and be sent out to the factories to earn its living. Um, and how does this change the debate? And one of, one of the things that I, I actually, I mean, I actually don't think that that's all that science fictiony. I think that pretty clearly we're not. Well, the, mor the morning after pill is already right. already there. Absolutely. And and all these technologies need to be tweaked to make them better. But but one of the things, sort of an interesting set of political ethical questions arises. And let's say hypothetically that there exists the technology to painlessly and risk free you know, remove the one-week-old fetus, uh, one-week-old bundle of cells, whatever exactly it is at, at one week, from, from a woman's body, put it in a test tube where it is, you know, lovingly brought up by scientists in the lab or some alternative set of parents or whoever, you know, but we have some provision adequately it's going to be taken care of. Um, does, what does that do to the abortion debate? Does that eliminate it? And one of the things that always strikes me about this is that, that you know, then, at least if you accept the terms of the hypothetical, right, which is that there's genuinely really no cost to the woman, there's no health risk here, you know, it's, it's, right. like, it's like having a mole removed or, you know, whatever. It's, it's trivial outpatient procedure, no complications ever, uh, takes five minutes, uh, and the state pays for it. Um, if, you don't want, if you don't want to bring this child to term, the state pays for it. All you do is, you know, ten minutes of your time. So accepting those terms, would we would we any longer think there was a right to have an abortion? Because, and if we did, that right would have to come down to some notion that a woman has the right to choose not to have her genetic offspring inhabit the right. world, which you might say should be a right, but we certainly don't grant that right to men, right? You know, I mean, if a man gets a right. woman pregnant and he can't compel a woman to have an abortion because he doesn't like the idea of having his genetic progeny in the world. Um, so, I, I mean, it's... It strikes me that we're not actually all that far from a situation in which the debate really shifts to one about population and to one about do you have sort of the right to control whether your genes proliferate as opposed to the current debate, which is about, you know, the, the impact on a woman's health, the impact on her autonomy, the impact on, on her future economic right. well-being and so forth. I mean, I think that 
the hypothetical you throw out would actually be transformative and revolutionary. I, I mean, I, I don't think it would it would remove the debate. I think you'd it would definitely shift alliances mm-hmm. politically to a certain degree, and you might have something more like the old alliance between you know people who are pro life right. and people in the Democratic Party who consider themselves pro poor and so forth allied against people who say, well, why should the state have to bear the cost of, right. you know, raising an unwed mother's test tube baby and so forth. I think it's interesting, though, to see what's happened with the morning right. after pill because, and, and I think actually this is another example of the trap that Roe has put both pro-choicers right. and pro-lifers right. in because the, mor- the morning after pill is a potentially revolutionary technology. Right. Um, the, the problem is pro-lifers have become right. so invested in... Like, it, it's, sort of, it's, the, it's the Well, but it's, it's not even that. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think life begins at conception. Everything that I've read about the morning after pill suggests that the evidence that it actually has an abortive face effect is very small. And it may have an abortive face effect in some, you know, 0.01% of cases. But generally speaking, it doesn't. And I think that, therefore, this is a place where it would make sense for pro-lifers, particularly in a country that's, you know, sympathetic to pro-lifers but generally leans pro-choice, to say, well, you know, here's a place where we right. should compromise and we'll train Wait, you. Can you explain, um, um, maybe, I just don't know about, don't, I'm embarrassing the ignorance of the technology. When you say it, there's not much, how does it work, then, if it doesn't have an, a, a what am I going to say? This is, this is, this is where I'd, I'd have to pull up the, I, I spent like a week <laughs> reading these studies at some point. But basically, the idea of the morning after pill, the theory of it, mm-hmm. is that it doesn't prevent conception, you know, is that it prevents conception. It acts as an immediate ovulation suppressor. Okay, so, so it the doesn't sperm, destroy the sperm are in the, the women's body. I get but it. if she hasn't ovulated yet, she won't ovulate. Okay. Okay. However, it also may have some, because right. it causes a hormonal change, right. it may have some effect on the woman's, right. uh, the woman's uterus. So the this is a distinction so that hinges on whether it's essentially uh, an effective, very last-minute form of contraception versus a right. uh, very right. early form of abortion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it seems like it's de- it, right. all the scientific papers I've read, you know, they, they can't, it's one of these things, they can't test it. Right. In women, well, and again, you know, the distinction is it's a pretty fine distinction, right? That something mystical happens when the sperm meets the egg. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't. I, it's a, bi- it's a biological distinction, though. I mean, I. It's a, of course. You can argue it's poor but philosophy. But why is it a biological like, distinction that is one that should be the line for public policy or for morality? I, I guess that's what I have a. That's why I term it a theological distinction. You know, of course it's a biological distinction. You know, something has happened that is different that creates a new potentiality that would not otherwise exist. But, but, it's not, not obvious that that moment is the morally significant moment. And I agree no, that it's, I think, it's an appealing I would say, one just I would say you can tell. I would say it's a suggestive. I would say right. it's a suggestive moment, and then what you have to do is set it against. I mean, I, I think the two the two main suggestive moments are the moment of the moment of conception, because that's the moment where right. ontologically a new right. organism of some kind comes into existence, or some definition of personhood that revolves around right. notions of either. Feeling right. pain, consciousness, Brain function or and, something, yeah, and so on. And yeah. well, uh, the the reason the reason I'm pro life is that I, I feel like those the latter group collapse into, you know, sort of moral theories that sort of that require you to allow mm-hmm. infanticide. That no, anyway, but that's, hmm. but, but that's a, the, the the original point I was making was just that the morning after pill I think could have a mm-hmm. revolutionary mm-hmm. effect mm-hmm. on. The debate over abortion and produce some right. interesting political right. compromises between pro-choicers and pro-lifers, and and so on. Where, you know, pro-lifers say, "All right, we'll let you, you know, fund the morning after pill up the wazoo in exchange for, uh, right. you know, a more serious ban on late-term abortions or something." But because we have a sort of, you know, everything's frozen in this debate over right. Roe. Right. So, it, but it'll be interesting yeah. to see if the, it'd be very you know, interesting if, if people can break out of this debate because I, well, I definitely I think that this particular framing and indeed this decision Gonzalez v. Carhart um, 
is not great for either right or left because it, it's it's full of peril for both sides. You know that that you know precisely because the the way the abortion debate has been framed pushes each side to defend positions that are kind of hard to sell to average people. You know, and and I it's only it's going to fuel kind of more fake culture war divisiveness unless candidates can find a way to kind of break out of those 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 boxes right but the problem is it all just comes down to who repl you know who replaces John Paul Stevens when he right. retires indeed which is what well, yeah. I mean it's just yeah. that's that I think is the only big you can't actually it's almost pointless to analyze sort of which way the judicial mm -hmm rulings are going because mm -hmm. it's all just like yeah you know who's who's going to be the swing vote in two years yeah but you know i i i'm going to turn into a pumpkin um yes no you have to you have second. to escape escape from new america yes and i just just to show you i've been drinking from my well you can't see this ross but i've been drinking from but my mug that they have provided me which just i'll hold up to the camera so everybody can see i really am here at the new america foundation i have a new america cup which is the only thing I've ever gotten out of this deal, and they probably aren't even going to let me keep it. So. I bet you could smuggle it out. You think though. I can? Although now, I now the, the water. evidence is I on tape. I have to take all the so. water first, though, otherwise it would get my bag wet. Uh, so. Well, Ross, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. We will have to meet again. Uh, Absolutely. Via. Maybe we can even meet in person someday on some, I, I don't, you know. I don't know. That would be weird. No, that's, that's crossing, crossing a line. Let's, right. let's keep it electronic. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Ross. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you soon, hopefully back on Blogging Heads. Absolutely. Talk to you soon, Rosa. Bye. Bye.